And good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Portland Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glenny. We're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. Thank you all for coming. And those who are live streaming on Judy Glenny's Facebook page. And also you can go to the website, portlandbiblechurch.com. At the top of the homepage, it has services and there's a drop down menu and you can link to YouTube there. And so after the fact, we try to post those immediately after class. And so most of you that uh, go to those or are on Facebook are already there. So thank you so much for being there. Um, our services, of course, as you know, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, and it looks like everybody got the time change. I thought maybe you wouldn't see some faces, but uh, you got the time change, so we're on daylight saving time, my favorite time. And so um, our class at 10 o'clock, and the second service is at 11.15. They're consecutive because we're teaching the book of Hebrews. We're currently in chapter 9, and so if you uh, have your Bible, you might uh, open as we're going through the introduction. So that's our Sunday class classes. And after the second service, we have about oh, a half hour or so of singing the great hymns of the church. So if you can join with us for fellowship and singing, that'd just be great. It's all part of worship. Last week, we had the communion service, also part of worship. And then on Thursday, we have our study in leadership. Uh, 7 o'clock Thursday night, right here, same time, same station, well, different time. And so uh, uh, we have uh, our study there. We've been going through 30 characteristics of leadership. So hopefully you can join us for that online or in person. And after our Thursday class, we have our time for prayer. So we have our prayer meeting afterwards, half hour or however long it takes. A lot of prayer requests out there. A lot of people having colds and flus this season. As they say, it's the cold and flu season. So uh, people have those in addition to uh, the other adversities that have come down the pike over the last several years. So we have a lot of prayer requests. We do have some praises. Uh, we know that uh, the conference went off well down in Houston and Robbie Dean and uh, 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 Myers uh, uh, were there and they got back from the Ukraine. And so we thank the Lord for that answer to prayer. And, uh, so apparently a lot of folks were there. Lyle went down, one of our uh, mem deacons, and he went down there to be a part of that and said, uh, everybody was there but me. <laughs> so hopefully next year we can go down to the Chafer Conference. It's Chafer Seminary is uh, works out of Albuquerque, but they have a conference every year in Houston at the West Houston Bible Church, uh, Pastor Robbie Dean. And so just a lot of great teaching goes on there for all of us as pastors and everyone else who can attend uh, that particular thing. So thank you that uh, the Lord uh, allowed that conference to go on without a hitch this year. <laughs> the hitch was all before, but uh, by the time they got there, it was a great adventure, but I'm sure that it uh, was a little bit hairy coming out of the Ukraine as uh, Robbie and uh, the folks got out. At any rate, uh, that's our classes. So one more we have on Wednesday right here. My wife, Judy Glenny, has a class for the ladies. She's currently going through the seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3. She's finishing up the last couple there, I think. She hasn't quite got to the Laodicean church, that lukewarm church, which I think typifies our own day. So it'll be interesting to see what she does with that. And so that's the information that we have. We have a uh, uh, one announcement that I've been making, and if you have not as yet gone to patriotacademy.com, I recommend that you check that out. Uh, as much as we are students of the Word of God, we are also patriots in our nation, and most people do not understand the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and these people, uh, uh, Rick Green and David Barton, are just uh, excellent in their understanding, we might say their exegesis of the Constitution Declaration of Independence. And so they're presenting this material. Over 200,000 people in our country have already gone through this training. Uh, it's available. You can get it. There are trainers out there. I think there's about a thousand trainers, which is really great, who are giving this training. And of course, uh, just the opportunity to really understand our Constitution <coughs> and hopefully to be able to uh, make good selections for the leadership. We're also helping that with our study of leadership on Thursday. So that's uh, patriotacademy.com, Rick Green and David Barton. You want to check that out. And one other thing, we just received uh, some booklets here from uh, <clears throat> Houston uh, Pastor uh, Robert Thiem. Years ago, I studied under him, one of the many people that uh, mentored me as a young pastor. Uh, this is the blood of Christ. And uh, we're in that section in 
Hebrews chapter 9, and this is just an excellent presentation. I use this for some of the documentation as I presented the blood of Christ. So it's really important. We have some here for the folks that are with us today. Uh, we just received these in uh, from Houston. And so uh, if you want one, you can get one. If you don't, if you're not here, give me a call or at the phone uh, or uh, uh, write to us and we'll be sure to send you one uh, free on the basis of grace. So those are available. That's the information that we're going to be looking at a little bit more today as we begin our study. It is our custom to take a few moments at the beginning of each of our studies for silent prayer. We feel this is very important. I've noticed that a lot of churches do not do this, uh, particularly on the television, but even in local churches. I think it's important that we take time at the beginning of each Bible study to make sure that we're in fellowship. The scripture is quite clear. We cannot understand the mind of Christ. We cannot understand the Bible if we're out of fellowship. That is to say, we do not have the enabling of the Holy Spirit. And we find that throughout the Old Testament, particularly under the Mosaic Covenant, they had to acknowledge their sin. They had two specific offerings, the sin offering and the trespass offering. The trespass offering was for known sins, the ones you know, and the sin offering was kind of generic because you may not remember all of them, but we wanted to cover them. And so in order to have your prayers here heard by God, we need to be in fellowship and have no unconfessed sin. So we take time for that purpose, and it's important that you uh, take time for silent prayer and allow the Holy Spirit to uh, bring to your remembrance any sins uh, that uh, uh, maybe you're not aware of so that you can confess them. The scripture that we use, although it's one of many, is 1 John 1, 9. There it says, if we believers confess our sins, that is to name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, the one that we confess or those that we confess, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe that picks up the ones that we uh, forgot or didn't even know about so that we can have that enabling of the Holy Spirit. So we take time for silent prayer to give you that opportunity uh, for the Holy Spirit to bring those to your remembrance, if any. Otherwise, to prepare your hearts and minds, get your notes out, your Bible out, and prepare for the study of the Word of God. So with that in mind, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your magnificent plan of grace. The fact that you've permitted us through free will to enter into union with Jesus Christ and with you, Father, in your eternal presence. We thank you that you've provided a means whereby our sins have been paid for by your Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And thereby we have direct access into your very presence, and we can come before your throne of grace at any time because of what your Son did for us. He is our advocate, our mediator, and therefore we pray on the basis of his work on the cross. We thank you for the things that we have before us this morning. We pray that you would encourage us, challenge, and motivate us by the things that we study, and we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved, casting all your care on him for he cares for you. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Submit your ways unto him, consider him in all ways and he will prepare your way. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word this morning to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 21. Hebrews 9 21. If you have your outline, by the way, the outlines are available at the website. You can go to portlandbiblechurch.com, the doctrine section. Uh, there's also another section for outlines, charts, and graphs, and maps. And so you can find the outline of the book of Hebrews. It's a rather detailed outline that we develop on the basis of the grammar uh, in the text. 
And so we're actually in the section uh, letter D, if you have your uh, outline there, and it's the superiority of Messiah's sacrifice. Everything in the book of Hebrews points to the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, this particular chapter compares the Old Testament sacrificial system, the Levitical offerings in particular, and Jesus Christ in his once and for all sacrifice bearing the sins of the world. And under point two, we looked at the superior results of Messiah's sacrifices, and we're down there in the superior covenant ramifications or ratification, and we see there by death and by blood. So we're in that section on the blood. Uh, we have looked at a, a special that we did on the blood, kind of an abbreviated form of the uh, blood of Christ, and so we noted the pamphlet that was available for you if you want the whole presentation, but I gave you, I think, a pay, about two pages on the blood of Christ. That's available at the website. You can simply go to the doctrine section and look up the blood of Christ. So you can do that. That covers chapter 9, 18 through 22. So we're kind of in the middle of that in verse 21. So I want to back up just for a moment to verse 18, kind of get a running start, and then we'll pick up uh, in our study in verse 21. So going back, if you have your Bibles, open to Hebrews 9 and 18. Uh, Paul begins here, I'm sorry, not Paul, but the, the writer of Hebrews. Uh, I don't think he wrote it, but uh, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it is, so we just say the writer of Hebrews. At any rate, in verse 18, uh, he uses that uh, uh, familiar concept, therefore. And therefore means whatever went before that is now summarized. And we see this periodically through the text of the writer of Hebrews, as well as the Pauline epistles, many times when they're having an intermediate summary, they'll say, therefore, and so uh, in this case, it really is a little bit, uh, 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 well, we see this, several of those. There was one back in, uh, let's see, where was it? Now we've, this is the first one for a while, so we'll start there. Therefore, even the first, and they've added the word covenant, because that's what they've been talking about, even the first covenant, that, of course, is the Mosaic covenant, uh, even the first covenant, it says here, therefore, even the first covenant was inaugurated, was not inaugurated without blood. So all the way through the scripture, we see that blood is essential in inaugurating covenants, going all the way back to the animal sacrifices that God provided for the man and the woman in the in the garden after they had sinned. And of course, for them to have animal skins, animals had to die. Now, it's not uh, spelled out expressly. In fact, we don't have much of a detailed explanation of the animal sacrifice till it's codified under the sacrificial system in the Mosaic Covenant. However, we see it all through the Old Testament as well. We even see uh, before the time of Moses, obviously, uh, after Adam, but we see in the time of Job, after the flood, when they came down from the mountain out of the ark, uh, uh, they had uh, a, uh, they, they had the, uh, I'm sorry, that was Noah. <laughs> uh, when Noah came down, he did that, but Job also had sacrifice. He sacrificed for his children in Job. And of course, Noah sacrificed when they came down from the mountain. All of these sacrifices point to one thing, and that is the person of Jesus Christ and his substitutionary atonement on the death. So that's verse 18. And then 19 says here, for when Every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people. We noted that in the previous class, according to the law. Now notice the two different terms, covenant and law. The Mosaic law spells out the details of the legal system. Uh, that is the law with regard to spiritual phenomenon and all the sacrifices and how they were offered in the priesthood and also the judicial system for the nation as a whole. So that would be the Mosaic law. But it's the same thing, and it's also called the Mosaic Covenant. That indicates the relationship that God has with his people. So covenant is a relationship, the law, of course, the legal tenant, and all those things that were required. And so here he speaks of both the covenant, which is understood in verse 18, and the commandment in 19. And when it had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats, and we noted last week the water and the scarlet wool and hessop things that he mentions here, and of course uh, they're mentioned briefly in the Old Testament under the Mosaic system as part of the sacrificial system. We noted that Hesop, of course, was used 
back in the Passover to mark the doorposts and the lintels to keep the death angel away from the Israelites. And uh, we also see Hesop used uh, as it was uh, placed up to the mouth of Jesus when he was on the cross with the sour wine and so forth. So we see these having significance. Of course, the water uh, is always part of the sacrifice, although it's not mentioned very often uh, by those who comment on it, but water was part of the sacrificial system as well, particularly in connection with the red heifer offering, which we described several weeks ago. So all these words are significant, and obviously the writer of Hebrews is a good Jewish person, good Hebrew, and he understands all these things, and for those that he's writing to, Hebrew Christians, they would understand them as well. We've taken the time to uh, look at each of these because obviously most of us are Gentiles uh, in the church, at least uh, for the most part, and we have no understanding of the Old Testament. So I spent the time going back and looking at that. And then verse 20 says, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. God commanded a blood sacrifice. It's detailed there. And verse 20, of course, goes back to Exodus 24, verse 8. And then verse 21, which is where we left off last time, he starts out, and in the same way. Now here, it's interesting, we have uh, a Greek word, homoios, which means in a similar way, or likewise. And uh, this is, uh, uh, it's interesting, this is second to the last word in the sentence. So even though it's the first in the English, it says in the same way, of course, and comes first, but then in the same way, that actually occurs towards the end of the sentence. So in the Greek, the order is different. It doesn't really depend on sentence order to make sense. Obviously, the sentence order or the order of the, uh, the particular words in the sentence have greater significance, and it goes first, first word, last word, second uh, after the first, and then the second from the last. Those are the important words. They work in from the beginning and back from the end because of significance. And so the idea of similarity here is important. So in the same manner, what does he talk Talking about Well, obviously the blood of goats and calves and all of these things were part of the sacrifice. It says he sprinkled them on the book and all the people in verse 19. And so he sprinkled here as well. And he says in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle. Now the, pardon me, the tabernacle is the tent of meeting. And so the tabernacle is the outer covering with all of the animal skins and everything that made up the actual tabernacle at that time. And so I don't know that he went around and covered every square inch of the tabernacle, but symbolically he uh, sprayed blood towards the tabernacle, probably in various locations, I'm guessing northeast, south, and west. So he did sprinkle the tabernacle, it says here, and uh, this is what we find in verse 21. And then it says all the vessels of the ministry with blood. Now, the vessels, of course, uh, we see in the Old Testament that the scroll was uh, sprinkled with, with blood and uh, obviously the tabernacle. Uh, and so we see that and the altar, the horns of the altar, and of course the mercy seat. But there's no place that actually delineates the fact that every vessel, that would be the, uh, well, the cups and anything that was used to carry the blood was actually sprinkled with blood. But apparently the writer of Hebrews knows something that was given by inspiration that was true but was not recorded by Moses. Kind of interesting. And so everything in the tabernacle, all the furniture, uh, all the vessels, everything that was in there was apparently sprinkled with blood. Now I'm just surmising that after the sacrifices were given, then the priests who had the duty would go in and cleanse all of those things with water. They would all be washed and the blood washed off until the next time. And when the sacrifice was offered, then the blood would be sprinkled on all the vessels again. Now, I can't say that for certain, but obviously it sounds like they wouldn't just leave dried blood on all the all the vessels in the tabernacle. So I'm guessing that later they were washed and cleaned for the next time that the animal sacrifice occurred. That would mean, since they did these things daily, that obviously they had to be sprinkled daily when the blood sacrifice was given, and then they had to be cleansed with water daily as well. And so apparently the writer of Hebrews, under inspiration, gives this information that's found nowhere in the Old Testament specifically. And so we have these vessels. Uh, the tabernacle, of course, we do have. And it says the vessels of the service. 
And of course, that would imply uh, all of those things that were used in the tabernacle. Now, these passages are, go back, and if you will, go back with me to the book of Exodus. We'll look at a couple of these and see what's there in terms of the sacrificial system. Again, the writer of Hebrews assumes that we would understand all of these things, but uh, obviously many of us do not. So the book of Exodus, particularly chapter 20 and following, really all the way through the, uh, the five books of Moses. So Exodus 20 on through Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In places, we see the sacrificial system and the sacrifices and all of the um, tabernacle and its furnishings, everything that was there is described in detail. And in chapter 24, I think we did look at this one time, but let's go down there to verse 6. And here it, after it says it talks, the, talks about the peace offering, the burnt offering in verse 5. And it says, and Moses took some of the blood and put uh, it uh, put it in basins. And so that would be one of the things. Now you say, well, the, the blood's in there, but even uh, this would have been sprinkled with blood as well. All the, the vessels, it says. And uh, here it says uh, that uh, he sprinkled, and, and then on and the other half of the blood he sprinkled the altar. Well, we see that mentioned several places. And then he took the book of the covenant. That would be the scrolls, of course. Uh, that he had uh, written based on what God gave to him instruction-wise on the mount, uh, 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 on the, uh, uh, what's the mountain? Mount, mount Sinai. Okay, thank you. And he read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. <laughs> Famous last words, you know. Uh, it's kind of like us. Lord, I'll never do it again. I'll be good all my life. And that's what we say to the Lord. And then next day or the next minute, we're off doing things we shouldn't. So the people said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. I don't know if you ever said that, but be careful. <laughs> that's loaded because they didn't. And God disciplined them accordingly, as you know. So we have the basic passage here. And then really at the end of the book of Exodus, restated in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 9. Exodus 40, verse 9, we read this. It says, Then you shall take the anointing oil, here's the anointing oil, of course, not the, not the blood, but the anointing oil, and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it, and shall consecrate it and all its furnishings, and it shall be holy. Now, the writer of Hebrews doesn't mention the anointing oil. He simply mentions the blood. But there's quite a, a rigorous ceremony that's involved in this sacrificial system and obviously not all of it is explained in detail although tradition tells us many of these things and now the writer of Hebrews adds to our knowledge under inspiration and then we see it expounded over in the book of Leviticus in Leviticus chapter 8 look at Leviticus chapter 8 beginning in verse 15 Leviticus 8:15 Next, Moses slaughtered it, that is the animal, and took the blood, and with his finger put some of it around the horns of the altar. Here we have another piece of information, and purified the altar. And he poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar, and consecrated it to make atonement for it. So we have it here, and then when we go to verse 19, a little further down, Moses slaughtered it and sprinkled the blood around the altar. So we do have reference there. And then we go over to uh, Leviticus 16. And really we have 14, Leviticus 16, 14 through 16, where we see additional information. In Leviticus chapter 14 and verse 16, uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus 16, 14 through 16. And there it says, the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering uh, that would be the same as the trespass offering or guilt offering. That was for known sin that were committed. And the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed. In other words, someone who had committed a sin. So this is additional information with regard to the trespass or guilt offering. And on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. Now, we are not given the information as to why that is done, but that's what we find. And the priest shall take some of it, uh, some of the log of oil, and pour it on the left palm. Uh, of course, oil represents the Holy Spirit. Blood, of course, essential for the sacrificial system as well. 
and then the priest shall then dip his right finger into the oil uh, that is in his left palm, and with his finger sprinkle some of the oil seven times before the Lord. And then the remaining oil, which is in his palm, the priest shall put some of it on the right ear lobe of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe, and on the right foot, and uh, uh, on the blood of the guilt offering. Verse 18, while the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf before the Lord. Aren't you glad we don't have to have all of that done? Basically, we have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it picks up, obviously, our guilt, sin, our trespass uh, through simply 1 John 1, 9. We don't have to go through all of this with the high priest because Jesus Christ has cleansed once and for all. And so uh, these various rituals that were part of that taught and look forward as a shadow and type of the fact that Jesus Christ purifies us once and for all. We should not take that lightly. Think of all the routine that they had to go through constantly whenever they committed a sin. Just imagine this morning you took a few moments before class for silent prayer to confess your sins. If you had to go to the priest, you'd have to go through this whole routine uh, every time that you were going to have any confession of sin. This is what you had to do. So it's just amazing, and God has given us this grace and I think sometimes we treat it very lightly. It's kind of like prayer, the incredible power of prayer. And yet people just blow it off. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can't do anything else. I don't know what else to do. I guess I'll pray <laughs> instead of having prayer as the first order of our agenda in any situation, whether adversity or a blessing. We should thank God for those as well. So this is why I wanted to go back and look at these uh, rituals, because you see all of these are fulfilled in the person of Christ and his specific work on the cross, bearing the sins of the human race, uh, designated by the blood offering as we have taught it. All right, so we have this then in verse 21 here. It says, uh, the tabernacle was, uh, of course, sprinkled, and the vessels of the service with blood. So there's the blood again, and it's through this whole section we see the importance of blood, and therefore I hope that you have uh, that uh, material we uh, posted online, which is the blood of Christ, um, and it was a, a, a brief, and we also have the books available if you want a more detailed presentation. Okay, that takes us to verse 22, and according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And it's interesting here because we think uh, uh, blood is something dirty. If we get blood on something, ooh, we want to get it cleaned off immediately. Uh, and yet in this scenario, we find that blood was actually a cleansing agent. About the only thing I can parallel that to is that within the body, the blood carries nutrients uh, uh, through the bloodstream and it carries away the toxins as well. And in that sense, uh, the blood is a cleansing agent in our body. And so we understand that from its medical uh, perspective. And so apparently God used that in the uh, process of the Levitical sacrifices and use it as a picture all the way through. And so that's why he says here, and it's interesting, according to the law, and then this, this phrase, uh, skedon, S-C-H-E-D-O-N, is an adverb that means almost. And they have added the words here uh, in this text. It says, one may almost say. Actually, the, the Greek word is just almost. But the phrase implies the fact that you could say that blood cleanses everything. Now, obviously, water cleanses. Uh, the Old Testament said that the oil also cleanses, the Holy Spirit cleanses. But basically, he's saying here that in the sense of the Levitical sacrifices, the blood cleanses. And that's what he's saying here. So he says basically in this verse, according to the law, one could almost say all things are cleansed with blood. Doesn't mean that everything's cleansed with blood, but we can say that based on the Levitical sacrifices because everything in the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, all the furnishings, all the vessels, according to the writer of Hebrews and the Mosaic Covenant, were sprinkled with blood, and that was the means of cleansing. And so, of course, the idea of blood carries all the way through to the shedding of blood by Jesus Christ, his spiritual death on the cross. And so it says then here, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. 
Now, the forgiveness, of course, was anticipatory of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. No one ever uh, had really had their sins forgiven. They were anticipating the salvation of the future Messiah who would come. And so they were kind of put on hold, temporarily set aside. One commentator said the Old Testament believers had their sins, uh, as it were, swept under the rug. But as you know, if you clean house and you sweep the dirt under the rug, sooner or later, someone will pull up the rug and say, what's all this dirt doing under here? And they clean it out. And so uh, in that sense, of course, the Old Testament saints had their sins kind of set aside and they could go on because they were basically anticipating that once and for all, someone would go and cleanse under the rug and get all that dirt out. And that's what Jesus Christ did. Now, that's where the writer of Hebrews is going. He's been there in types and shadows. He is not going to let go of that. Even in chapter 10, he's going to continue with this theme because although it's difficult to understand, it's exactly what God did. Some people say, well, I just can't believe that. Well, it is a matter of faith. And the fact that Jesus Christ died for every sin of every man, woman, and child, past, present, and future, from Adam to the last man on planet Earth, that's hard to understand. It's a matter of faith. But that's the way God did it. That's the way his word teaches. And we either accept that or reject it. However, rejecting it causes us to lose out in the eternal blessings and, of course, uh, will sentence us to the lake of fire. So it's no small thing to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though that may be difficult in the sense that people say, well, I just, I just can't buy into it. Well, that's what the word of God says, and we trust that, and we're willing to stake our eternity on it. And we might say to the unbelievers, are you willing to stake your eternity that when you die, there'll be nothing and not a lake of fire to go to? And so they're, they're flipping the coin saying, oh, well, I hope I die and nothing happens. But then again, what if there is a lake of fire? Are you willing to take that chance? Faith alone in this difficult to understand Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, that will give you your pass into eternal blessing under the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So it says, one may almost say or nearly say, this phrase is only found three times in the New Testament, uh, twice in the book of Acts, and uh, once, of course, here. I'm going to look at just one of them in Acts to show you how this works out uh, in the text itself. So in Acts, because it's an unusual construction, in the book of Acts, chapter 13, Acts 13 and verse 44. 13 and 44. Now here it says, And the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. So there it is. Almost everybody came. So they had a large percentage of the population who came. Obviously, everyone did not. And so the idea of nearly uh, is what we find here. And so uh, we could go over also chapter 19 in Acts, since we're right there. Acts 19 and verse 26 19.26 says, uh, And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Now, everybody didn't agree with that. Everybody didn't believe that. But he's saying that a large percentage of those in Ephesus and uh, really the entire area of Asia and Asia Minor, most of the people had heard the message of Paul, whether they believed it or not, but many were persuaded, and he's saying here a large number, and uh, almost all of the people had heard it. Did they believe it? Not all, but they almost all had heard it. We could say that today because of the media. Sometimes I don't turn on the news because I'm studying the Word of God, but people say, did you hear it? I go, oh, I hadn't heard that. But I would have to say, because of the media and Facebook and all of the uh, various sources that people have, almost everybody heard it but me. And so that's the idea. So when we come back then to our verse in Hebrews 9.22, it doesn't say that it's an exact uh, uh, re reproduction here. It's not exact because it says here, almost, we can almost say that blood cleanses. I mean, blood does not cleanse everything. But we can almost say that in connection with the Levitical sacrifices, because their blood did cleanse, 
and uh, made clean. Obviously, if you use soap and water, that would cleanse as well. Water itself is a cleansing agent. And even the oil, he said, was a cleansing agent. So not everything is cleansed with blood, but you could almost say in connection with the Mosaic Covenant and the Levitical sacrifices that blood does it. So that's what he does. And then he says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Now, that, of course, referred to the Old Testament sacrifices. And so when people go to this verse, they say, therefore, Jesus must have shed his blood for sins literally. However, there's a problem with that. The Old Testament sacrificial system required that the animals were uh, cut uh, usually their throats were slit, they were hung upside down, and the blood was drained out so that they could take it into the basins and do the sprinkling uh, for the high priest on the mercy seat, on the Day of Atonement, and for other sacrifices that were done daily, sprinkle it all around the tabernacle. And so uh, the idea here of blood is different in the Old Testament. Now, we spent time on that, and so it's not the fact that we have uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, that he somehow carried a container of blood into the third heaven and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Nothing in scripture ever says that or indicates that. It simply says when Jesus died on the cross, it is finished. That means there was nothing left to do. Now, when the high priest offered the sacrifice and slaughtered the animal and had the blood in the um, container, it wasn't finished. It was not finished until it was sprinkled on the altar and around the altar and sprinkled in the various vessels uh, and the things uh, dealing with the tabernacle. And on the Day of Atonement, it was not finished until he carried that blood in to the Holy of Holies and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. And yet Jesus said, it is finished. And when he dismissed his spirit, every passage that we have says that he went into the presence of the Father and sat down and is currently seated at the right hand of the Father. No carrying of blood, no sprinkling of his blood on the mercy seat. All that was on earth. Yes, he did bleed a little bit, but the blood that is mentioned there is spiritual, and it is the bearing of sins that's referred to by the blood of Christ. I know that people wrestle with that sometimes, and they go, it's nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. And what they're thinking of is the literal blood of Jesus Christ, as if somehow his blood was drained out. By the way, it was not. Not like the animal. He certainly wasn't hung upside down and his throat wasn't slit. He was nailed on the cross. And while he was still alive, he said it is finished, was done before he died physically. Even if they had drained his blood out, uh, it was he, his payment for sin occurred before he died. And after his death, after his physical death, and the sins were paid for, his side was pierced by the soldier and out came blood and serum or water, which is the, the serum is the idea there. So blood was still in his body uh, after death. So obviously the literal blood is not the issue. Now the physical death of Christ is significant because he couldn't have a resurrection body unless he had died physically. So that is essential that he died physically and we understand that he indeed did because when the soldiers came to break the legs of the uh, individuals on the cross so that they wouldn't be hanging up there. Uh, they could take them down before the Sabbath uh, began, which was the first of the unleavened bread, the day after Passover. And so they came to Jesus, and he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. The soldier pierced his side. And so the blood indicates there simply that he was dead, but uh, no blood was carried into heaven. Nothing, uh, by the way, there are some who even teach that Christ did additional atoning in Sheol Hades, if you can imagine such a horrible thing. He said, it is finished. It's kind of one of those words, if you say it's finished, uh, what don't you understand about the word finished? <laughs> and so it was finished when he was alive on the cross, and then he dismissed his spirit and uh, died physically. And then, of course, uh, he was taken down, and he raised three days later and ascended into heaven. And uh, as his ascension, he said, basically, and this is my thinking to the Father, uh, the work is finished, the work is completed, mission accomplished, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. So when we say here that, uh, that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, that had to do with the Old Testament sacrifices and the fact that our sins are forgiven by the spiritual death of Jesus Christ represented by the blood. Now, I tried my best to explain that. I'm sure it won't satisfy everyone, but that's the information, the best I can present it. And the writer of Hebrews is doing his level best 
to present that and compare and contrast the Levitical sacrifices from the Old Testament with the unique sacrifice and bearing of sins by Jesus Christ. And so without the shedding of blood, and of course that goes all the way back to Leviticus chapter 17, might just hold the place one more time and go back to Leviticus chapter 17, 11. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. And we noted this in a previous class, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now that has to do with animal life. Uh, animal life, the life of the animal is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. So the atonement again anticipates the work of Christ on the cross. And so here it's talking clearly about the animal and its blood. Notice again, the life of the flesh, animal flesh is in the blood and I have given it the animal flesh and blood to you on the altar. This has nothing to do with Christ in the future to make atonement for your souls. And it is by reason of this life that makes atonement. That is the life of the animal, which is in the blood. So that, of course, is what we're talking about. And then this word shedding blood is interesting. Uh, it's a compound word that actually has uh, uh, the shedding and blood in one word, and it's a unique word that the writer of Hebrews has coined here. Um, and so we have Haima Tech Cusai, uh, and it refers to the shedding of blood or bloodletting or blood shedding. Without blood shedding, there's no remission of sin, no forgiveness of sin, and that's basically what he's talking about here. All right, well, that takes us up through the 21st verse. And we go to uh, 22nd verse, I should say. So let's go on. We have just a little time in the first session to verse 23. Once again, as we saw in verse 18, he begins with therefore. And here's another therefore. And so whenever we see the word therefore, uh, usually in the Greek, it's un, O-U-N. And it shows an intermittent, intermittent conclusion. So based on what we had from verses 18 to 22, he says, based on that, therefore, he says in verse 23, it was necessary for the copies of the things in heaven to be cleansed with these. With what? The animal sacrifices and the blood. So basically this same blood that he mentions all the way through from verse 18, which we saw without blood, uh, no covenant was inaugurated, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. And then he says, based on this, 18 through 21, therefore, it is necessary for the copies of the things in heavens uh, to be cleansed. Well, several things here. We'll probably not get the whole verse done in the first hour, but we'll take a look. Uh, this word here, uh, it is needful or it is necessary. An egg K uh, in the Greek, it means uh, uh, a necessary uh, compulsion or compulsory activity was necessary. And then our friends, some of you remember, we have two particles that are conjunctions. They're called coordinate conjunctions because there are two of them. And the first one is M-E-N, and the second one is D-E, de, men, de. Well, in first year Greek, we learned that when we see these in a particular Greek sentence, they're not always translated. But what they mean is, on the one hand, a certain thing is true, but on the other hand, something else, usually in contrast or different to the first thing. So we might say, it was needful, therefore, on the one hand, it's not there in the text, but it's there in the Greek, on the one hand, copies of the things in the heavens. So obviously, copies are in view, and this is a repeat of what we saw over in chapter 8. So if you go over, for example, to chapter 8 and verse 5, it says, uh, we serve, uh, uh, those who are doing the tabernacle, the priests, serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses is warned by God. And so they were to erect the tabernacle, copies. Here it is again. So we have a repeat of Hebrews 8, 5. Copies. What are the copies? Well, they are uh, the Greek word hupa uh, digmate, which means under a, a, a sample or an example, under an example. So the copies are under the example. The example is the true tabernacle in heaven. And I really didn't realize the fact that there's actually a tabernacle in heaven set up in the presence of God 
that's well i should say the tabernacle on earth is like that one that's the real tabernacle the original deal and he says it several times in the book of hebrews and uh, he's the only one that really states this idea that they were just copies uh, paul of course hints at it but the writer of hebrews is very clear that uh, what we had on earth in the tabernacle and all of the temples to follow in fact even in the millennium they're all copies of the original in heaven. Now, the one in the millennial kingdom is going to be pretty spectacular as a tabernacle, but they're all copies for instruction of the people. They were in the time of Moses, in the time of Israel, under the Mosaic Covenant. They will be again in memorial during the millennium. Uh, even in the tribulation, there will be a tabernacle uh, of sorts set up, the temple, of course, which is going to be defiled by Antichrist. So it is necessary, therefore, on the one hand, the copies of the things in the heavens. It's interesting here, the word says heavens. That indicates that there are multiple heavens. Paul spoke about going to the third heaven one time, the very <clears throat> presence of God. And so when Jesus ascended, he ascended up through the atmosphere into the clouds and, of course, into outer space and beyond space and time into a place called the third heaven. Paul apparently went there one time and saw things that were indescribable. John apparently had an opportunity uh, before uh, when Jesus Christ came and spoke to him uh, to be taken up and to see some of these same marvelous things. So copies of the things, and so we see that in a number of places. I think we'll come back and look at some of the Old Testament passages. We've done it before where it speaks about them as being copied from the original in the Old Testament. Example, Exodus 24 and Leviticus 8 and 16 uh, that we've already seen, but we'll come back to that. But I want to finish the verse at least uh, in terms of the, the context, but Here's that little particle or conjunction, de. On the other hand, we might say, by way of comparison, heavenly things themselves are cleansed by better sacrifices than these. Now, we're going to have to deal with that because we have obviously heavenly things. That would apply to all the furnishings uh, that are in that true tabernacle. But also, they're cleansed by better. And then we have sacrifices. I wrestled with this some. I had some help from uh, Dr. Furbach uh, as he explained the significance of multiple or plural for sacrifice. Because Jesus Christ only made one sacrifice for all time. It's compared to all the sacrifices of the animals in the Levitical system. But here, uh, it's what we call an intensive plural. I didn't really understand that. An intensive plural, kind of like the Hebrew uh, counterpart called the uh, uh, plural of majesty, where it's, uh, a, it's a plural used in a singular sense for intensity. And so his sacrifice is so unique that it's put into the plural here. Well, we'll see that when we come back and we'll finish this verse in our second session. Uh, so that means it's time for us to take a little break. Uh, pause for the cause. And so uh, we'll close this session in prayer. Father God, again, thank you for the opportunity of studying these tremendous passages. Even though some of the material here is difficult for us to understand, nevertheless, the writer of Hebrews does his very best under inspiration to clarify these things for us and for our understanding. We thank you for this. We pray that it would give us confidence, not only in your word in general, but in terms of the work of your son, Jesus Christ, in providing our so great salvation. And Father, for that one person who's here today without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want that person to know that you had them personally in mind when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into human history. He lived a perfectly sinless life and qualified, therefore, as a second Adam, if you will, uh, to be the sacrifice. And John spoke of him when he came down to be baptized, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, looking at Jesus as if he were the Levitical sacrifice of the Lamb. And Jesus certainly did that. He was qualified and therefore, as a sinless sacrifice, went to the cross and bore the sins of every man, woman, and child, past, present, and future, on that cross once and for all time. And you can have eternal life right where you sit right now in the privacy of your soul. You can simply express to the Father that you're believing in Jesus Christ and that he died on the cross for your sin and was raised from the dead to 
to be the sufficiency for our salvation and the forgiveness of sins. Won't you do it before you leave? God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed son, his only born son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, again, thank you for this opportunity to fellowship in your word, to study together, to be edified, to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.